Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. I'm Philip Eitzen, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement, advisor to procurement leaders around the world, and the founder and managing director of Art of Procurement. My team and I work with our global network of subject matter experts to help companies elevate procurement impact whether that's through building and implementing transformation programs, sustainably reducing external expenses, or leveraging AOP Mastermind, our learning and development platform for companies of all sizes. You're listening to our flagship podcast, where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their results with the needs of the business. The landscape for hiring procurement professionals and for being hired has definitely changed dramatically over the past couple of months. But what does that mean for procurement professionals looking for a new role or for executives looking to hire the next star? Well, in today's podcast, I share my recent conversation with longtime friend of the pod, Mark Holyoke. So I'm not sure I've even told Mark this, but he was the very first person to subscribe to Art of Procurement five years ago and someone that I actually first worked with on an open role all the way back in 2006. I think it's the third time that he's been on the podcast. Mark is the founder of Holyoke Search, which is a US East Coast based procurement recruitment firm and someone who always has his finger on the pulse of the procurement recruitment market. So I started off the conversation by asking Mark how the recruitment market is holding up in the face of some pretty strong headwinds. So it's still a a bit of a mixed bag Mm -hmm. out there. But uh, at a macro level, I think there are some observations that I can share based on my day-to-day conversations. Uh, Some companies, especially those in the retail hospitality and, and travel industries are, are obviously getting decimated. They're widely impacted by layoffs and, and furloughs, and, and my heart goes out to those affected. And if I can help anyone over the coming months as they go through their job search, please, you know, those, should, those people should get in touch. Um, a, a lot of the procurement executives that I've been speaking to outside of the hardest hit industries, though, actually believe that procurement has taken on a more important role than ever Mm -hmm. at their their company Uh, and their teams do feel pretty secure in their jobs right now and that's that's obviously great news yeah Um, yeah the the level of contract recruitment amongst our clients has definitely increased in response to the need to bring expertise into the business uh, short term and in a more flexible manner. And with regards to permanent recruitment, you know, I've actually found that the most senior level searches have been affected the least. Interesting. So there's, there's no question that in general, it, it's slower than normal yeah. out there. That being said, honestly, as, as recently as this past week, I've just started to get the feeling that we're we're close to turning a corner. Mm -hmm. Companies have started to move their attentions sort of beyond that initial shock to the system, if you will, and toward the the, the resources that they're going to need to propel themselves forward in the coming months. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. That's positive to hear, you know, that you haven't seen a, um, a wholesale grinding to a halt if you will of the um of recruitment because you really never know as as we're in this phase of kind of trying to figure out what's next how that's going to impact different people and while i think we all agree that procurement has such an important role to play to help you know to be part of the solution you know that doesn't mean that the budget constraints don't still come along with that so um you know that's oh, for sure that's good to hear and so you know as you think about that you know, one of the things that came to mind as I was thinking about where recruitment has been and where it's going, you know, for procurement folks is, you know, we've, we've talked a lot. And I think you and I have probably talked a lot about um, the war for talent, the best talent within procurement. Does this 
kind of opening up a little bit of the market and the impact that it will have on, on a lot of industries, does that mean that that war for talent is over? Or are you going to find that those in-demand skills that were in-demand before are still going to be in-demand because, frankly, there aren't enough of them around our industry. And so they're just as sought after as ever. Yeah, good question, Phil. Uh, honestly, I think that remains to be seen. Mm. You know, with, with everything that you read in the, the news media, y- your first instinct would be, I think, that that war for talent that we've seen over the past 12 or 18 months or more would likely be over. Yeah. That the market's been flooded with active job seekers and and professionals with an appetite to move into a new job or a new industry that's more stable at the exact same time that that many companies are laying people off or furloughing them en masse or have at the very least slowed hiring down significantly. That being said, if you're a hiring manager with one of these many companies that's placed a temporary hold, on on hiring, I think you really have to consider how you're going to compete for talent when nearly every company out there hits the play button right. on hiring again in the next few months, and particularly at the the junior to mid career level. I'm actually inclined to think that the the managers will struggle again mm-hmm. to find good people mm-hmm. um, unless they are really starting to seriously consider investing in their personal branding and in their their interview process. Now, that's interesting that you talk about that, um, about, because I did want to talk about personal branding and um, kind of personal branding for procurement professionals. But I'm actually going to start by asking, because it's a good segue into personal branding for executives, you know, and the role, the need for an executive to position themselves as being, you know, we've talked a lot about employer of choice, but it's a kind of a boss, an employer in, in the terms of an individual that you want to go and work for. Um, is that something that you think is going to be more and more important when we think about hiring the best talent that, that folks essentially want to work for the people that have the best reputations, not necessarily the companies that have, you know, the, the brand, if you will? Oh, 100%. Right. While, while many are going to think of personal branding as, as most applicable to, to the active job seeker that's looking to distinguish themselves amongst a, a sea of other candidates, uh, your opportunity here may also be related to talent right. acquisition. Um, the, the adage that, that people leave bosses, not companies, well, mm-hmm. that's true, but it, it goes both ways. People join bosses too uh, and done well. Uh, an investment in personal branding is now going to help you find and access talent that I think you'd never normally be able to. And as I just mentioned, you know, this is, this is amplified when all of these companies suddenly start hiring again at the same yeah. time in, in the coming months and everybody's competing for the same people. But by, by contrast, if it's done poorly, you're going to pay the cost of a, a long drawn out hiring process mm-hmm. and an inability to, to secure the very best candidates, no question. And I think even more strategically, and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm rather shooting myself in the foot here, but this all helps, you know, it also helps the procurement officer who's looking to create a sustainable inbound talent acquisition and retention model, not yeah. just like you said, based on the company's brand, or their willingness to to pay to retain a search firm like mine at a time when they need someone, but based upon their own reputation and that Mm -hmm. of their team in the industry. All right, so we talked a little bit about personal branding, uh, certainly in the context for execs, but um, I think it's something that's really important for all levels of procurement professionals. I know it's something that you talk around a lot, so I just wonder if you could share a little bit about, you know, when we think about personal branding, what does that really mean for a procurement professional? So the, the notion of a, a job for life doesn't really exist anymore, right? N- notwithstanding current market conditions, millennials are, are job hopping more than any other generation before them, and that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Mm-hmm. What it does mean though is that your career trajectory and your success in finding meaningful interesting 
challenging work at, at an ever more senior level, it doesn't hinge just on your ability to do your job well anymore or, or your ability to impress those in your immediate orbit, if you will, but much more so on your ability to develop your reputation and put it out there to the world so that others know about you and they're willing to open up doors for you too, mm -hmm. right? So personal branding is, is essentially about controlling the story that people tell about you when you're not in the room. Uh, and, you know, the, the thought of branding, I think, or influencers, right? It brings on nausea to some, I, I get it, but it's, it's not an ego driven exercise anymore. It's, it's a business imperative, right? If you're in the market for a new job and you're just applying online and putting some feelers out there to your immediate network and you're doing nothing today with respect to personal branding, it's my belief that you're turning a two to three month problem related to coronavirus into a six to 12 month problem. Mm -hmm. At least your competition's gotten stronger it's going to take you far longer to find a, a job. And even if you are gainfully employed, presumably you have ambitions to, to move up the corporate ladder. And, and the current situation is going to put those ambitions on hold for a lot longer than it should if you let it. Again, personal branding, it's about radically building the size of your audience and it's elevating your reputation in the industry in, in a way that's going to open you up to potential job opportunities that other people are not hearing about. And it's an ongoing process. It involves putting the time in today so that you're in the best possible standing mm -hmm. tomorrow. So, um, so what does that look like? You know, when you think about, um, is it, hey, I need to be going and becoming more vis um, let's vocal or visual or uh, whatever that may be on social media or sharing some of my thoughts and experiences and things that I've done, you know, in a blog or making, um, trying to make stronger connections with folks that I may be connected to offline. Like where, when you think about, Hey, I'm a professional, a professional. I want to invest in myself for my personal branding. I want a stronger personal brand. You know, where do I start? Sure. Well, I think all of the examples that you gave are, are great examples. But I think it can seem a bit overwhelming yeah. uh, and if you don't know where to start. So doing something that's systematic, I think, is, is, is key. And doing something that is authentic is, is key as, as well. So let me try to give you some sense of what steps that I'd take. So step one, right? First, you want to figure out what you want to be known mm -hmm. for. What makes you you? What are your long-term career intentions you really should be thinking about these topics semi-regularly anyway so it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that difficult um how do you want to be perceived who's your audience right good branding as i said it should be authentic it should be an honest reflection of who you are as a person and as a professional because the more authentic yeah. and the more comfortable you are with your brand the more likely you are to make sharing a habit mm -hmm. and the more that you share the, the more that you you reach okay step two is once you've set those those goals and you started giving some thought to who the audience is you're going to want to decide what you want to share and, and how often so what expertise or experience do you have that is going to bring value to to others what do you enjoy talking about that's going to provoke some lively discussion like good shares that get engagement on, on all of these platforms, they should educate, they should inspire, they should ask questions, they should provoke healthy debate, they should offer a, a new viewpoint, right? And again, people should draw on their own experiences mm -hmm. and um, they should feel very comfortable getting you know, some of that knowledge and experience out there uh, because it's content that people do want to to consume given given a chance um last step you know once you know the audience once you know what you'll be sharing start to build your following yeah. right it's increasing your connections it's 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 getting on the right platforms and for most people that means linkedin and, yeah. and twitter like right? twitter's where you're going to share your hot trending topics and 
You're going to follow industry leaders. You're going to hashtag your way into, into being seen. Probably even more so, uh, though, is, is LinkedIn. It's even more yeah. ubiquitous along, amongst a lot of procurement professionals. And it's certainly a platform that I personally use a, a lot. You're going to share larger pieces of information here. So posts, links, shares from other procurement influencers uh, or articles that you've written and, and published y- yourself directly mm-hmm. on, on the platform. Um, the key here is just with, as with any other relationship, it, it's frequency, yeah. it's consistency, yeah. and it's it's relevance. Uh, I think the mistake that most people make is that they think they can cultivate a loyal following just from, from likes alone. Right. There is a bigger investment in in, in, in this than, than just doing that, but it shouldn't be anything that feels overwhelming. Again, this should be this should be fun. It should, should be something that comes, you know, quite quite naturally to you. If this is based upon a subject matter uh, that you you enjoy talking to other people about. Mm. Yeah, and and just kind of the insider tip there on links. You said on, uh, on likes, sorry, on LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn doesn't really. When you think about expanding your reach, likes don't really mean that much to the LinkedIn algorithm anymore. You know, it's all about engagement. It's all about people commenting. You know, you want to be trying to encourage folks to engage in a conversation with you because that's what LinkedIn values. That's what keeps people on the LinkedIn platform. And that's what, you know, uh, their algorithm likes so that they will then go and amplify your voice even further. So getting oh, no, no question. getting conversation started, so important. And I think getting started is the operative word, right? There's a lot of people that are going to, Think about this and say, well, I'm never going to get as high a profile as, as other people. Yeah. Right? And, and well, one, I, I simply don't think that's, that's true. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, I think I am, what, what I have been able to accomplish personally in this regard over the past few months and the, the opportunities that that has led to for, for me professionally is, is testament to that. So I'm happy to talk to anyone about that off, offline if they have an interest in, in doing so. But I think what people need to know is that Honestly, some of the most high profile people on LinkedIn are in the personal branding business them, themselves, right? They're good at it, yeah. sure, but they, they should they should be. And you don't need that high a profile in order to accomplish the objectives that we're we're setting out here. LinkedIn as a platform is I think it's ripe for this kind of content mm. development and sharing. And yet very, very few people are really taking advantage of that currently and that that's certainly the case within within the procurement community i I genuinely think you have this opportunity to radically build your reputation without an over investment in in your time yeah it's interesting i think as procurement professionals we're somewhat um kind of we've been brought up to think that information may be power and that whole kind of power dynamics and leverage when it comes to negotiations and it's almost like we don't want to share things because well what if my next potential supplier is watching and they get some tips on how to negotiate against me or something like that and honestly I don't know what you feel about that but I feel that that's kind of you know that built we have to lose that Um, we have to really start to think more about transparency relationships and people wanting to work with us because they know who we are they know us um, as opposed to trying to hide information and being afraid to put ourselves forward because that may open us up to other things no question and this need not be information that's that's private and confidential but uh, this this may simply be information that you're accustomed to sharing with others at in-person networking events Mm -hmm. and those are not happening right now conferences are obviously taking place uh, virtually but for the time being if nothing else personal branding uh, needs to take some place of um, you know, what you are normally doing, the activity that you're normally you know, uh, spending time on, you know, getting out there in the world and, and sharing war stories uh, and anecdotes with, with your procurement peers, because that in turn you know, has always led to, to some interesting professional opportunities. But in lieu of that, you know, you need to be getting on online and sharing that in, instead. Yeah, I, I just as we kind of close out um, the conversation on personal branding, there's a couple of things that you talked about that I just want to um, to highlight again to pull out that I think is so important. And that the first one is the authenticity. Um, 
And I'll be honest, like when I started the podcast, you know, I don't know if I, it's not that I tried to be somebody that I wasn't, but, you know, for example, I would over edit the conversation. So I didn't sound as though I was somebody who was new to this podcasting game. And I was kind of trying to feel my way through it and, and figure out what worked and what didn't. And there came a point, maybe it was six or nine months in, I thought, you know what, I've got to be myself. Um, and you know, that will, some people will appreciate that and some people won't appreciate that. And I'm okay with that because we, you, you don't want to set this persona up of somebody that you're not, because then you've got to try and live up to that. Um, and you're only setting everybody up for, uh, you know, potential disappointment at that point, because you're painting this picture of you being a person that you're not. So really being authentic, being yourself, really important. And the other thing that you said was consistency, you know, be there every 6 a.m. on a Monday morning, you know, like we are with the pod, whatever is your date and your time, so that once you start to build up um, a following or people who are interested in what they say, they're going to look you out. They're not just going to sit and wait and see, well, did, um, you know, Joe post something? Uh, well, I'm just going to wait until I see something come up in my feed. Well, no, they're going to go to his blog and say, well, I wonder what he's talking about this week. And that's really then how you start to get in front of people and um, start to build up that trust factor. So I know you mentioned those in kind of the steps, but I think those two things are really important. At least those are things that helped me as I was building the podcast up. I think it's right. It's a, it's a mindset thing. This, yeah. this needs to be an activity that you integrate into your, your, your day to day, no, not something that you consider to be uh, something you do if you've got an extra few minutes at, mm -hmm. at the beginning or the end of the day, but something that is driving uh, toward an objective that you have uh, that is opening you up to opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise be exposed to if you weren't doing this. Take that 20 to 30 minutes a day or, or two to three times a week, whatever it is, and, and build that into your, in, into your day, into your job search strategy, into your c career plan. And, um, uh, and if you prioritize it, again, it, it, it takes a little bit of time to, to get up and, and running, but you will see the results, yeah. I promise you. Well, Mike, I know that um, while I have the opportunity to be uh, speaking to you, there was one other topic area that I just love to touch on right now because it's something that um, you know is definitely impacting organizations today and, and is most likely going to do for the uh, foreseeable future. And that's again, coming back to the recruitment process. Obviously, we're not able to do anything in person right now. So all recruitment that is happening, and like you said at the beginning, recruitment is still happening, is all remote. Um, what challenges does that bring and, and how do you see both companies and candidates kind of approaching that to overcome the hurdle of, hey, I'm going for a job and I'm never going to meet the person or I'm going to hire somebody without ever, ever having have met them because that's a very different feeling than the typical recruitment process. Sure. Well, no, first of all, let, let's acknowledge that there are some incredibly talented individuals out there in the market who are currently looking for a new job through no fault of their own. And if, if you can act as a company before others do, I think that presents a, a potential opportunity for you to attract and, and retain the services of some incredibly high potential people mm -hmm. or those with a very niche skill set that you might not normally able, be able to. And, and that's a wonderful thing. Candidates are prioritizing stability, flexibility, and meaning to their work over salary alone. And if you can speak well to all of these three over the course of the interview process, I think you're going to reap the rewards over the coming years. In terms of the, the challenges that the companies are, that are hiring are facing, though, I think the key consideration is is the need to adapt the interview process right. to better suit the current market. And, and like you said, the fact that most everyone is now working from home and, and will be for, for some time to, to come. It, it's not just a question of, of replicating the, the interview process and then just exchanging in-person interviews with video conferences or, or phone calls. Like if that were the case, just polishing your, your video conferencing skills uh, would, would be enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, in actuality, you need to think in terms of replicating what each interviewer 
actually gets out of the experience and under normal circumstances that is and in terms of maximizing the chances that the impression that you're able to leave candidates with is a positive one and, and that's that's more difficult um, for example so video interviews can get pretty complicated when you've got multiple people on the call mm -hmm. right and, and the social cues that you would have normally during an in-person interview that aren't there. So you're going to want to talk to some of the other stakeholders that are in the interview ahead of time to determine who's going to run the call, how to effectively take turn asking questions. Uh, and moreover, I think hiring managers need to be proactive about addressing the unique circumstances that have created the need for these video interviews in, in the first place. Right. And they've got to humanize that conversation, yeah. right? Normally, like you said, a candidate is going to get the chance to check out the office space, get a feel for the, for the vibe of, of the place, assess how they're greeted by the front desk, meet you physically, consider the, the dynamic between the various team members that they're meeting. And these factors, these are huge differentiators between two or more otherwise, you know, very similar job opportunities and, and you as a company you have got to figure out how to way to, to replace those or at, at the very least find a way mm -hmm. to sort of address them over the course of the interview uh, and similarly candidates they've got to consider you know, how they need to adapt their approach to nail the interview you know, they've got to figure out they've got to discern you know whether the company's culture is a good fit for them they've got to identify any red flags along the way and they've got to do all of this without the opportunity to meet anyone in person or ever even set foot in the office knowing that even if they start a job that they're, they're also not likely to ever meet right. that person physically or set foot in that office or attend you know a lunch with the team or a happy hour you know until months and months into into the role so it's 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 a very sensitive sort of time and i think it requires some advanced thought um probably more thought than a lot of companies and candidates are, are giving yeah. it at the moment yeah i feel like never before has first impressions been as important as you know start as a, a hiring manager you know starting the call on time being there and creating a safe space you know not just jumping straight into the questions um, but just helping kind of build up that personal human to human connection because your candidate isn't necessarily going to know what to expect when they come on the line. And if you just jump straight into questions, then, you know, it shows that it's a very transactional conversation versus one where you're truly trying to get to know one another. And I think that it's, you know, the, the power in that conversation does rest with the, the, um, the interviewer to create that space where the interviewee feels comfortable, you know, in being themselves, in being authentic and not just seeing this as, um, you know, uh, here's 10 questions kind of thing. And I'm just going to run through these and make it very uh, matter of fact. Oh, absolutely. Phil. I think that, you know, it's really off putting, you know, if that's the approach and the attitude that you, you take, you know, the reality is that all of us and this, this includes hiring managers. It includes candidates, right? We're, we're dealing with a lot. Yeah. Again, we may not all, all be home, but we're dealing with um, circumstances that we never dealt with before. Many of us are, are juggling stress in our professional life, stress in our personal life. We're homeschooling kids for the first time on top of full-time jobs or full-time mm -hmm. job searches. And to not acknowledge any of that, uh, to not take some time at the beginning of the interview to understand a person just a little bit better, I think, is is, is incredibly short-sighted. Uh, and so I think there are some accommodations. I think there's every every opportunity for people to make a good impression and to prepare for those video conferences in a way that they would prepare for an interview to, to ensure that they yeah. make a positive impression. But mm -hmm. I think there's also uh, an obligation to to give some allowances to, again, what people are, are going through, that they're in a, a less than optimal situation right. and that you know, they probably don't want to be taking a video conference interview at home with you know, the kids running around downstairs yeah. any more than, yeah. than you want to be interviewing them over video 
you know, as opposed to having having them come into your office either. Mm -hmm. All right, Mike. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time today, for your guidance on uh, the topics that we talked about on branding and where we are in kind of that interviewing process. Um, I think there's some encouraging words about the state of the recruitment market for those who, um, you know, are looking for the next opportunity. Obviously, it's a really tough time at the moment. But um, again, I want to thank you for your time and just ask the last question which um, is the, the easiest question of the day, I think. And that's if listeners would like to know more, reach out, connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. And if you don't mind, let me just preface that with what I would consider to be a, a call to action here yeah. for, for those people who, who are listening. Um, the current market conditions that, that we're seeing are unquestionably causing challenges for, for job seekers and, and hiring managers alike. We, we've talked about this, but we've also talked about the opportunity here to distinguish yourself from the majority of your peers and, and turn these challenges into a unique opportunity. And, and I sincerely believe that to be the case. You know, some of these changes that need to be made can be done so immediately. Others are an investment now that are going to come to benefit you in the future, both should be priorities, though, in my mind, not in spite of everything that we're seeing mm -hmm. you know, out there that, that's going on in, in the world, but because of it. And I'd highly recommend that people get started right away. If they have any questions for me, I'm very active on, on LinkedIn. Um, so go follow my, my profile, yeah. my firm's profile, and uh, very, very easy to, to reach if you'd like to have a private conversation um, off, off the back of that, that introduction. Uh, you can also visit our website, holyoaksearch.com, and subscribe to our, our newsletter and our, and our blog. And yeah, it's not intrusive, uh, but there's some really useful information that's going to come your, your way sort of periodically that I think is, is an actionable information, whether you are an active job seeker, whether you're just a career-minded procurement professional, um, or whether you're a hiring manager or a procurement um, officer, you know, looking to uh, establish a, a more effective talent acquisition and retention sort of pipeline you know, within your business. Um, uh, again, I'd love to keep in touch with everyone and um, yeah, re reach out. Again, LinkedIn is probably the best place to start. Okay, great. Well, what I'll do is I'll include a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes for the episode today and also a link to uh, Holyoke Search for your website. Um, and the links in the show notes, they're going to be at artofprocurement.com slash podcast. You will just um, be able to see the most recent episodes. You'll find this one with Mark and everything is going to be um, on that page. So once again, that's artofprocurement.com slash podcast. Mark, um, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for your insights. I really appreciate catching up and talking to you. Thank you, Phil. It's been an absolute pleasure to be back on the, on the pod. Um, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. I want to thank you for listening in to my conversation today with Mark. So my big takeaway that I want to highlight today is the importance of personal branding, not just being hired, but also as a key contributor to the success in hiring. I know that I've personally joined organizations on the strength of the personal brand of their CPO. And the fact is that for those procurement professionals with the most in-demand skills, the hiring market is going to remain competitive. And unless you work for a company with a top 20 corporate brand, you really need to ensure that you have a personal brand that attracts the best candidates. To subscribe to our weekly newsletter, This Week in Procurement, and never miss an episode, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. And you can find our back catalogue of over 300 podcasts from the past five years at artofprocurement.com slash podcast.